My name is unimportant, but if you feel you must call me anything, you can call me Kent. And I'm going to tell you something that happened to me about five years ago. I lived in a nice community in a small house on the outskirts. It was a good place to live. I had a good neighbor, but... After what happened, I never felt safe in that house again. And I don't think you would either. For information, I had a good job. I could have actually lived in a much fancier community, but I liked the small town feel. I liked living in the outskirts, technically outside of the city. And I like keeping to myself rather than being in the thick of things in a big city. It just hasn't appealed to me, and it still doesn't. This story begins in the evening. I was mowing my neighbor Amy's lawn. For the record, Amy was around my age, divorced. We were never romantic. We just became friends. She had hurt her, well, not hurt, broken her wrist a few weeks earlier on her job, so I was helping out with the yard work while she mends. After we finished, she had given me a burger, fries, and a drink she ordered from a restaurant as a thank you for mowing her lawn. We said our good evenings. I went home. The burger, fries, and drink were all really good. I cleaned up what dishes I had and decided to browse YouTube for a while before taking my shower. Then I popped in a movie. Ironically enough, a slasher film. Yeah, the irony of that will never get lost on me. Then, I started to settle down for another night. I live in a one-story house, so there's not a big layout. I went in my bedroom, put on a YouTube live stream as I often go to sleep to them, and... Within two hours, I fell asleep. Later that evening, I woke up. Nothing unusual. I tend to wake up at random hours of the night. But I couldn't explain it. Something felt off. Something just didn't feel right about the situation. Instinctfully, I grabbed my phone and put it in a pocket and picked up my flashlight, which is kind of a... It looks like a miniature baseball bat, and it has the grooves on them that some people call skull crushers. And I turned it on. Strangely enough, when I opened my bedroom door, there was a... draft in the house. That didn't seem right. No windows open. I locked all the doors. How did the draft get here? Well, I went back in, opened my nightstand drawer, and grabbed my gun. 1911 Colt, 45 ammunition, and put one in the chamber. I turned on the flashlight and began to search through, look through my house. I turned into the living room to see my front door wide open. I locked both the doorknob lock and the deadbolt. So, 
that door being wide open was not a good sign. Rather than examining the rest of the house and risking the chance of bumping into someone that I don't know where he is, I decided to go out the front door. I got on the phone, called 911, light tucked under my arm, gun pointed to the door. Operator, hello, 911, what's your emergency? I think someone's in my house. I woke up, the front door was wide open, I had both locks locked, but someone got in anyway. What's your address? I gave her my address. She said, someone will be with you shortly. And for record, this is a small town. There were about five cops on at the night shift. There was actually, surprisingly enough, three or four detectives, but they only worked day shift. The day shift had, like, triple the staff as the night shift. And the operator said, told me, well, someone will be with you shortly. We've had a car accident on a, I'm not going to name the road, and we need to pull officers off of that. Just stay on the line. I said, sorry, but I'm not staying on the line. And because I need to be ready to defend myself. And I hung up. I pulled, turned my light back on. And just took a defensive stance staring at that door. Figuring that is where any intruder would come out of. After a few minutes, a figure emerged through the door. This figure was about six and a half feet tall, wearing a black trench coat, black pants, black gloves, black boots, and had on a Japanese Hanya mask. Now, if you know anything about these masks, they're used in Japanese theater, and depending on how you look at the mask, straight on, it may appear to be laughing maniacally. Tilted down, it looks sorrowful, but I could just sense a maniacal grin under that mask. My blood still runs cold thinking about this, and he had a Japanese Tonto in his hand. I had never been in a self-defense situation before. I began to feel flustered, but I ordered in as clear of voice as I can. Clear and strong of a voice. For, I, I still don't like talking about this to this day. I'm getting flustered just thinking about I declared in as strong of a voice as I could DON'T MOVE! and I aimed the flashlight at his eye I noticed that the blade did appear to have streaks of red on it meaning he already used it I'll, I'll, I'll shoot! The figure just tilted his head to the left, then to the right, and took one step forward. I moved, took a couple steps back, and he started to run. I fired two shots, and he fell over. About this time, I heard sirens. I didn't immediately e drop the gun as I knew I would have to before the cops get there. Well, not really have to. They would have told me to drop it, but it would have been better to drop it after hearing a gunshot. I walked up and checked for signs of life. I pulled the Hanya mask off to see a <laughs> baklava over his face, and I checked for a pulse. No pulse. I ejected the magazine 
and threw the gun towards the house. A few minutes later, a squad car with two officers showed up. They told me to put my hands in the air, which I did. It didn't take long for them to figure out, even without me saying anything, that I defended myself from an attacker. There were some back and forth calls and they said one of the day ship detectives is going to be reporting to the scene. They asked me a bunch of questions that no doubt the detective would ask me again. I decided to go, well not decided, they even told me just go in the house and my gun may or may not be given back to me, given the fact that there was a shooting. I decided, since this is going to be a long night and there's going to be a lot of people in and out, put on a pot of coffee, not just for me, but for the officers in and out. All night, I grabbed a sugary drink to help with the adrenaline in my nerves, in about 15 minutes, a balding detective by the name of Stanton came and began to ask, and he asked me the typical questions. Do you know anyone that would want to kill you, etc., etc., etc.? I said no. He asked me to come outside. They had already taken the bakava off of the face of the attacker. He asked, do you recognize this man? Soft face, he had soft facial features, brown hair and blue eyes. I hadn't recognized him in my life. The detective said, okay, well, this was looking to me like it was clearly a random act of violence. I can't confirm that yet, but that's what everything's telling me. We go back inside and talk a little more. Now, his blade was bloody, so they did check the neighbors. And I still don't like... Before that sick freak broke into my house... He killed Amy. Not just killed, brutalized. There was no signs of a struggle, so the working theory is he stabbed her in her sleep, but she was stabbed in the chest so many times they could not determine how many stab wounds there actually were. She was a good woman and a good friend. I, I still don't like talking about it. After several hours, which went into the afternoon, the detective gave me his card and said, if you figure anything out, call this number and if you don't hear any information from me in a few weeks call this number or come to the station and see me about four weeks later where I hadn't heard nothing I decided one day to take a walk to the police station I asked to see Detective Stanton and the girl working the desk asked someone to bring me to his office. A polite officer walked, took me to the office. The detect detective, ah, oh, Mr. Kent, good to see you. Yeah, it's nice to see you too, Detective Stanton, I replied. I hadn't heard any information from you. Have you found anything out about the attacker? He drew a deep breath, looked at me, and said, Just in case you lost my card, take this. 
and call me. I looked puzzled, but I kind of got the sense he was telling me something covertly. When I walked out of the station, it said, Tomorrow noon, Ed's Burger Shack. I, needless to say, I didn't sleep good that night. I made sure to be at the Burger Shack at 11.30, and he was already there. I asked, so, Detective Stanton, what's going on? Why the cloak and dagger thing here? His face actually grew cold, and he told me something that, again, made my blood run cold. Well, we ran the attacker's fingerprints. No fingerprints on record. No dental records either. Even DNA evidence. We found nothing. And after some trying, the, de the chief got a phone call and said, and he was basically told, drop it. At least that's what I'm figuring, because after that phone call, the chief told me to abandon this case. I don't know what's happening, but I'm actually putting in my resignation, being ordered to abandon a murder slash attempted murder. I don't know what's going on here, but I don't like it and I'm getting out of town. I looked at Detective Stanton and said, you know, that might be a good idea. This town just doesn't feel right anymore. I don't even feel safe in my own home. It took a couple months, but I put the house on the market and I was able to relocate out of state. This is my story. I'm not telling you this for any other reason other than I need to get it out of there. But if you ever wake up and have a similar experience to my mind, to mine, don't hesitate to defend yourself. Run out that front door and make your attacker come to you so you have a fighting chance. Well, that's my story. I know it sounds fake, but I assure you it's real. I still have the nightmares.